Hello, and thank you for joining us. I'm Jean L. Pratt Williams from Newark at the University of Chicago, and I'm the co PI of the CAP project. The main goal of this presentation is to share the resources and tools that can support you in conducting economic evaluations, often referred to as cost analyses. For our agenda, we will briefly spend some time providing an overview of the CAP project, introducing the team, discussing economic evaluations, and some common challenges when conducting these evaluations. We will highlight a few of the resources we created to help with conducting cost analysis and cost effectiveness analysis before demonstrating how to use one of our cost estimation templates, CapCat 1.2. After that, we hope you will join us for some questions. The Cost Analysis and Practice Project, or the CAP Project. So the CAP Project is a three-year initiative funded by the Institute of Education Sciences, U.S. Department of Education. It provides free on-demand tools, guidance, and technical assistance to researchers and practitioners who are planning or conducting economic evaluations. It also supports cost analysis, cost feasibility analysis, and cost effectiveness analysis of educational programs and practices. We have a few members from the CAP project team here today, and we each will introduce ourselves. As I mentioned, I am Jean-Al Pratt-Williams, I am, I, and I am the co-PI of the project, and I'll turn it over to my colleague, Fiona. Hi, I'm Fiona Hollands from Teachers College, Columbia University. Hello, I'm Rob Shan from American University, and I'm going to transition to giving us an overview of economic evaluations, which is an umbrella term that we use to refer to cost analysis, as well as other related forms of analysis. So to start, you might be wondering, why you need to conduct a, a cost analysis or other forms of economic evaluation in the first place, unless of course, IES or another funder has simply told you to. And we contend that beyond complying with funder mandates, there are additional benefits that you might consider um, that would motivate you to conduct economic evaluations, even if you don't have to, or to also make sure that you're maximizing the benefits you get from economic evaluations that you do conduct. Uh, and some of the benefits of, of these kinds of evaluations and these forms of analyses are not as obvious as they might first appear, because ultimately cost analysis is not just about money, the dollars and cents, the, the financial resources that go into something. And in fact, we argue that it's pretty important to think separately about resources rather than uh, financing or money and think concretely in resource terms. And in that sense, then a cost analysis is really um, answering a question of what an intervention really is at its core. In a sense, it's how a theory of action is really operationalized or put into action in terms of the actual inputs that go into it. Um, and in taking a very close look at that, that can help us more fully understand what the theory of action is, how it's put into place, how it differs from what is customarily or what otherwise would be done or what is the treatment contrast. It can help us contextualize results and understand more about implementation and it dovetails very nicely with implementation analysis. Um, in addition to maybe some of the more obvious benefits that you might be thinking of in terms of informing decisions, um, helping us to allocate resources to where they're going to do the most good and, and, and achieve the, the best results for, for the lowest investment of resources, as well as considerations for equity in terms of thinking about how both resources and inputs at, as well as impacts are, are distributed to different stakeholders, different students and different schools. Uh, so cost analysis is really the, the basic type of analysis. It's kind of a, um, it, it's sometimes used as a blanket term to refer to all of the types of analyses, although we prefer economic evaluation to avoid ambiguity and focus on, on cost analysis is really about telling us what are all of the things that go into an intervention? What are all of the resources, regardless of who provides them, who pays for them, whether there's a financial outlay or not? And so it's good for answering questions like, what does it take? What does an intervention look like on the ground? As well as, can I afford it? Do, is it feasible for me to do an intervention with the budget and resource constraints I face? There are other forms of analyses where you can extend a cost analysis. And in most cases, the basic cost analysis is going to be identical or extremely similar. 
regardless of what other type of analysis you choose to complement it, but you can combine costs with effects in various ways that can help further enhance your evaluations and decision making. Probably the most basic is cost effectiveness analysis, which is good for comparing among alternatives that have uh, the same single measured outcome. If you want to look at a single program and determine whether it's worth it on its own or include multiple outcomes, then you might consider cost benefit analysis, which uh, allows you to incorporate several different outcomes based on how much society values them in monetary terms, which is what we call benefits. Uh, and that can tell you whether a single intervention on its own is worthwhile in addition to ranking interventions. Or you could also incorporate multiple outcomes by asking its stakeholders about how much they value those different outcomes and putting those on a scale uh, economists call utility and, uh, and performing a cost utility analysis. We'll focus primarily on cost and cost effectiveness analysis, uh, but, but um, wanted to introduce the different, the different types of analyses that might be, might be of interest to you. So the, the process for conducting a cost analysis in many ways really resembles any kind of research process that, that you might ordinarily undertake. The overarching method that we follow is the ingredients method, which was initially developed by Hank Levin in the 1970s and has been refined since then by him and, and several colleagues. And the basic idea follows the model of, of just about any research study. Um, I, I, I don't think I'd surprise anyone by saying that the most time that we'd recommend you invest is in designing the analysis. And it might require as much attention and planning and careful thinking at the design stage as an impact evaluation or any other kind of research or evaluation endeavor, followed by data collection, data analysis, and reporting. Part of the reason we mention this is that to the maximum extent possible, if this work is integrated into other evaluation efforts, such as the impact evaluation and, and, and particularly any implementation analysis, then it will minimize the amount of additional effort a cost analysis takes and also lead the cost analysis to be really well integrated into the overall study in a way that is mutually beneficial across the different aspects of the study. At the design stage, there are important considerations such as what is the question that you're trying to answer or the decision you're trying to inform, who is the audience, what is the particular time frame you're looking at, what perspectives matter, um, and we generally default to what we call a social perspective, which is really everyone, where we're going to try to conclude all of the costs to anyone, thinking about all of the different effects, and again, that brings in the opportunity to do some equity analysis and subgroup analysis of, of how those things impact different, uh, different groups of, uh, or different individuals. And then the, the following work on data collection, on data analysis, and on reporting, number one, is all much easier if it is strong, informed by a strong design. And number two, when you have questions about what kinds of data you want to collect about the different resources, their quantities, their qualities, their associated prices, and so on, then those questions are all informed by the decisions you made at the design stage. What question are you answering? What decision are you informing? From whose perspective? In, in what time period? So for that reason, we encourage you to uh, invest the most time in design. And we're, we're also happy at the end to answer questions you have about the design or other phases of, of the analysis. So this might sound like a whole lot of work because it's, uh, as I mentioned, it's a whole other research endeavor that ought to be aligned with the other research and evaluation work that you're doing. And you might think, well, you already know what the costs are because you know, if you're doing an intervention, it's a technology and curriculum intervention that costs $1,000 per student, then you know the costs are $1,000 per student. Um, and, or you might say, well, I had to write a budget for my, my intervention and my evaluation, so it can't possibly cost more, more than what I budgeted for because I don't have any more money to spend on it. And so uh, we're going to have a problem if it actually costs more than that. And we would still argue that it is worth the time and the trouble to do a careful and detailed cost analysis because the actual costs in economic terms do not always map on 
to budgeted expenditures. First of all, of course, things don't always go according to plan or interventions don't always roll out as they are designed as we see very, very often in research that we've done. But also expenditures are not the same thing as costs. We follow the economic definition of opportunity cost, which is really anything that has an alternative use is valued at foregoing the next best alternative use. So some things that could be missed, for instance, in just looking at budgets include things that aren't new investments, but are just reallocated from other purposes, things that are donated or provided in kind, things that show up on other budgets. So for instance, if there are transfers between levels of government, if there are capital expenditures that are often not on an annual operating budget, if there are inputs from other stakeholders, if there are if there's general administrative overhead, which might appear might not appear in a budget at all, or might appear in another part of the budget, those are things that could be missed just by looking at the, the financial bottom line. So in addition to the benefits of doing a cost analysis that I outlined at the beginning, uh, we also think that it could lead to a more accurate sense of what your intervention actually entails. So just to share one concrete example, this is a real example from our own work, comparing digital math tools. So we have assessments, eSpark, and LearnZillion. If we just look at the, the darker grayish green, uh, with um, that represents the expenditures. Those bars represent the uh, the uh, licenses and training fees that are associated with each of these digital math tools. We can see that LearnZillion and eSpark are both pretty similar. LearnZillion a little bit more at, at about $13,600 than eSpark, and assessments is, is much less expensive just in terms of financial outlays. But when we did an analysis looking at how this affected for instance, investments of teacher time or technology at the school, and also what was this was displacing, or or what um, what this uh, what was was done in place of, or what would have been done in lieu of these digital math tools. We saw that assessments actually saved a substantial amount of money due to saving teacher planning time. Um, eSpark was actually dramatically more costly than what it appeared just based on the off-the-shelf costs, whereas LearnZillion was modestly cheaper, which also changed the ranking between eSpark and LearnZillion. And so we can get dramatically different results looking at economic costs versus expenditures. So now my colleagues, starting with Janelle, are going to talk a little bit about how this is put into practice. Now that we have a shared understanding of economic evaluations, let's talk about some of the common challenges researchers often encounter when conducting an economic evaluation that we highlighted in a blog. So the CAP project team served as guest bloggers for Inside IES Research to discuss practical details regarding cost studies. Um, and one of the blogs focused on common challenges and efficacy trials, and we provided some recommendations to overcome these challenges. You can use the link that you see here to read the full blog, but one of the key takeaways is that the challenges that we highlight related to efficacy trials are often um, challenges that may apply to any cost analysis more broadly. So, <clears throat> the value of a cost analysis and navigating varied implementation. Here are two of the challenges that we highlighted. The first is that stakeholders may not understand the value of a cost analysis for educational programs. And to help stakeholders understand that value, you can note that a cost analysis can provide insights beyond whether there is adequate budget for a program. It can also help to estimate the cost of implementation in practice instead of as intended. Another challenge is inconsistent implementation across cohorts. If the variation is minor, you could document, document the differences to present a range of costs. If the variation is more substantial, you could choose to focus on the cohort for which implementation reflects how the intervention is most likely to be used in the future. Cost data collection. So two additional challenges may occur with the collection of cost data, which are the third and fourth challenge covered in the blog. There's often the challenge of wanting to collect accurate data, but that can place a notable burden on participants and researchers. Um, planning in advance and integrating the collection of cost data with the other data collection activities can help. The last challenge that we discussed is a question we often get, which is whether to use national prices or local prices, prices in your estimates, or even to use both. Um, determining what, which one to use or whether to use both is really based on um, a few things to think about. So consider the following. 
the audience for the results, uh, availability of relevant prices from national or local sources, the number of different sets of local prices that would need to be collected, and of course your research budget for cost analysis data collection. So there are a few resources that could be useful as you plan and carry out your cost analysis and can also assist with some of those challenges that we discussed. I will highlight these resources, but there are others on our website at capproject.org. Just click on the Cap Project Resources button on the website, or you can use the link that you see here to go uh, directly to the resources page. So one of the resources that I want to highlight is the Cap Project Cost Analysis Standards and Guidelines, the 1.1 version. And this is just practical guidelines for designing and executing a cost analysis of educational programs. Another resource is the checklist for cost analysis plans. You can uh, use this checklist to guide your cost analysis plans. It's designed to help users plan high quality cost analyses of educational programs or interventions with notes specific to a cost effectiveness analysis. Um, this checklist is helpful when you're writing your proposal. It covers things you should be sure to address in any cost analysis plan, including things like indicating from which sites you will collect cost data and where you will get prices for each resource. We also have a timeline for cost and cost effectiveness analysis. Uh, this resource is helpful for your planning and budgeting, uh, the timeline of activities for conducting a cost analysis. We collaborated with another team of IES grantees to create this resource. It walks you through each year of an impact study and what you should be doing to ensure that you're collecting the data you need along the way and not scrambling to collect or analyze um, data at the end. And the resources I highlight are just a few of uh, the resources available on our website. All are free to anyone at any time and you can visit thecapproject.org to see these or the other resources that we have available. One other resource I wanted to mention is that we offer free technical assistance. If you have any questions while you're using these resources or in general about cost analysis, you can always submit a help desk request. Just visit our website, capproject.org. Submitting inquiries about a cost analysis, a cost feasibility analysis, or a cost effectiveness analysis of educational locational programs is what you would use this resource for. A little bit about the request form. We ask for some basic information to help expedite your request and to keep track of who is using our supports. So it's pretty easy. You just complete the request and um, one of the CAP project team members will get back to you within two business days. And now I'm gonna turn it over to my colleague, Fiona Hollins to demonstrate our cost template, CAPCAP 1.2. Hello, I'm Fiona Hollins from Teachers College, Columbia University, and I'm going to demo how to use CAPCAP 1.2 which is one of CAP Project's cost analysis templates. You can find our Excel-based templates at capproject.org slash templates. CAPCAT 1.2 accommodates up to two programs, which could represent a treatment and a control condition if your cost analysis is accompanying an impact study. Or there may be alternative programs that you're considering for implementation and need to figure out which one is least resource intensive. You can have an unlimited number of sites at which each program is implemented. So for example, you might have 24 treatment schools and 26 control schools. Each site can host both treatment and control participants if you have a crossover design. It accommodates up to five years of implementation and you can actually go longer, but you'd have to extend the results table for costs by year. You can enter either local prices or national prices or both. In addition to estimating the economic costs of each resource or ingredient, you can separately document expenditures, the actual outlays of funds for items, such as stipends, materials, trainer fees, and per diems. Slide 24. The demo example I'm using to showcase CapCat 1.2 is also available on the Cap Project Templates webpage if you'd like to download it and follow along. It shows a fully completed cost analysis in which reading recovery is the treatment program and fast forward reading is used in the control condition. Is loosely based on a cost effectiveness analysis conducted as part of a research practice partnership with Jefferson County Public Schools in Louisville, Kentucky. Reading recovery is a one-on-one -on -one reading intervention delivered by trained teachers. Fast forward reading is a technology-based reading program. In the demo example, each program was implemented in 15 schools in 2017. Slide 25. 
When you open CatCat 1.2, this is what you'll see. Slide 26. If you scroll down, you'll find a list of workshop contents, worksheet contents, which tells you what you need to do or look at in each of the tabs in the worksheet. There are 16 tabs, but don't despair. Most of the work you'll need to do happens in just five of these, which I've highlighted in yellow on the next slide, 27. The first thing you'll need to do is go to the setup tab to enter basic information about your study or implementation design and review or change the default parameters that CapCat uses to calculate costs. Then you'll progress to each of the four ingredients tabs to enter data row by row about the personnel, materials, facilities, and other inputs <coughs> that are needed to implement the programs you are analyzing. The lists tab allows you to customize some of the drop-down lists we use in the ingredients sheets so that, for example, the program components reflect how your particular program works. Once you've entered all your data in the four ingredients tabs, you can use the other tabs for various functions. For example, if you included any centralized costs in the four ingredients tabs, like a district office supervisor who visits each school to monitor program implementation, you'll need to use the centralized cost tab for that program to spread those costs among the schools. If you want to look at cost results at each site, you'll go to the cost by site tabs and select the names of the sites from a drop down in order to populate the results. There are two tabs of summary tables that populate automatically. Then there's a graphics tab with a few colorful charts. Of course, if you're good with Excel, you can create your own tables and charts. Finally, the rates and geo indices tabs are at the end because most users will simply use the default values that CapCap provides for inflation, interest rates, and regional price parities. If you're a cost analysis pro and feel the need to change them, it's easy to do. This is a setup tab, which is where you provide information about your study or implementation design. A couple of tips in general about CapCap. Cells with gray fill are automatically populated, so you shouldn't enter data in them unless you consciously decide to overwrite what's there, which is often a formula pulling data from multiple other cells. In some cells which are not grayed out, CatCat provides default values, but you're welcome to change these to suit your context. In the setup tab, any cells that have red numbers or words in them are the ones you really need to pay attention to as they need to be customized for your study. So let's start with table one program information. There are a few instructions over to the right, which tell you what each cell is about. I've entered reading recovery as the treatment program and fast forward reading as the control condition. Let's stick with the default of one year of implementation as we only collected data for school year 17, 18. So year one of implementation is 2017. We don't need to change the next cell because our analysis only covers one year. If you have data covering several years of program implementation, you'd need to choose a base year to which CatCat should discount or compound costs to reflect the time value of money. Most often you'd want to use the first year of implementation as the base year, which is why CapCat has year one as the default value here. Cell B12 allows you to choose the year in which you want to present costs. CapCat will inflation adjust all prices you use in your ingredients tabs to the year you enter here. So while we kept this as 2017, if you're trying to inform someone about what these costs might look like in 2021, you'd simply switch this to 2021 like this. And all your cost results will be adjusted upward to reflect inflation over the past four years. The last two cells in, ta in table one ask you to indicate your units of analysis. Often it will be schools with teachers as the subunits. Sorry, often it will be schools with students as the subunits, but you might have a different design like classrooms and students or districts and teachers. These labels are carried to many other cells in CapCat so that the worksheet is customized to your design. And that's it for table one. Table two is for key parameters. In this table, the only cells you have to complete are the two red items, which are the number of units in each condition. Our units for schools, and you'll remember that I said there were 15 schools implementing each program. The cells above these are pre-populated with default values when you first open CapCat 1.2. You can read the explanations that you'll find to the right of these cells and decide whether you want to change them. This is a good place to come back to when you're doing sensitivity analysis, as you can test out whether changing each of these assumptions makes a substantial difference to your results. Table three is the list of interest rates that are used to spread the cost of durable resources like laptops or buildings over a number of years. The default rates in CapCat are US Treasury bond yields from 2020, 
except for the one year rate, which we set at zero. You can update these if you wish or leave them as is. Table four is critically important. It's where you enter information about the sites at which the programs are being implemented. Starting in column A, you'll enter the name of each site. We very imaginatively named our schools T1 through T15 and C1 through C15. I hid some of the rows for the screenshot so you can only see six of them listed. I also have one row for the district office at the bottom, which isn't a regular site in this analysis because it serves no students directly, but it does bear some of the costs of the reading programs, so it needs to be listed here. In column B, you can use the drop down to indicate yes or no as to whether the site serves treatment students, and then enter how many students in column C. In column D, you can use the drop down to indicate yes or no as to whether the site serves control students and then enter how many in column E. Normally that would be all you need to enter for a site. I added two extra columns for this particular study for my own convenience, where I could indicate how many reading recovery teachers and teacher leaders were at each school. You repeat these steps for each site until they're all listed here. For centralized sites like the district office in this analysis, which contributed resources to all the schools, you can see we indicated yes, for both treatment and control conditions, but listed zero for students. The students are already accounted for at the school sites. Once you're done, row 50, the pale blue row at the top of the table, shows you the total number of students in each condition. Now let's move on to the ingredients tabs, which is where you enter information row by row about each resource needed to implement the programs. This is a picture of part of our completed personnel tab. There are 42 columns in this tab but you can only see the first 17 here. To produce a cost estimate, data entry is required only in the columns with headings that are bolded and underlined. I've also highlighted these in yellow so you can spot what I'm talking about. Some of the non-mandatory columns are for optional labeling and information to help keep track of what you're doing or to store notes about how each resource is used. In some of these columns, you'll find a dropdown in each cell, which if you use it, will allow CapCat to calculate a variety of cost breakdowns which can be useful for reporting. As before, gray columns self-populate. White columns may have a default value in them, but you can change those if needed. If you click on the first of those two tiny plus signs at the pink arrow, you'll get a row of instructions that tells you what goes in each column. Click on the second plus sign and you'll get some example rows already filled out. You can click on the minus signs where the two pink arrows are now to close these rows as they may take up most of your screen. Now, I'm going to do a speed through of each of those 42 columns. Yes, I really am. It takes about seven minutes if you need to fast forward. Are you ready? We'll go column by column for one ingredient, the assistant superintendent for teaching and learning. She spends a small amount of time supervising the implementation of reading recovery across all the treatment schools. In column A, you can enter a site ID, that's optional. Column B is critical. Use the drop down to select the site name. This dropdown gets populated from the setup tab, table four. You can always go back and add more sites if you forgot one or if you get late joiners. Column C, site type, is an optional label. And there's also a dropdown which is normally set to allow you to select school, district, or state. If you need something different, head to the list tab and change the selection there. Column D, personnel type, is also an optional label but can be helpful for creating categories of personnel. For example, school-based, or district-based staff. Column E is a specific ingredient name, Assistant Superintendent for Teaching and Learning. Column F, the component or activity, is a very useful label for any program that has multiple activities going on. This has a drop-down list, which again, you can customize in the lists tab. Column G, this is for you to write some notes about what this person does for the program. In this case, the Assistant Superintendent serves as the Reading Recovery Site Coordinator. Column H has a drop down in which you can use choose startup or ongoing. Startup costs are those that are, are incurred only when you first set up the program, but you don't need to invest in them every year. Ongoing costs are recurring, that is, you do need to invest in them every year. Column I, for personnel, the unit of cost is often an annual salary, but you could have something else like an hourly or weekly rate. In column J, you indicate how many of this ingredient you need for the program we need just one assistant superintendent. Columns K through P are used for local price data, 
and then columns Q through W are for national price data. You don't have to enter both sets. We did for this analysis, but you could just fill out the local price columns or just fill out the national price columns. The only thing you should not do is a few of each. Let's do the local prices. Column K, enter the year from which you obtain the local price, 2017 in our case. Column L, enter the price itself, $153,960 is the average local salary for assistant superintendents in this district. Column M, you can indicate from where you got this price. We used a public database of salaries, but that, that this district has to maintain, but most districts have a salary schedule that you can get hold of. Column N shows you the inflation adjusted price, but in this case, it hasn't changed because our price was from the same year in which we want to express costs. Column O is for the local fringe benefits rate as a percentage of salary. Note that if you get paid $100 per day plus $50 in fringe benefits, your fringe benefits are 50% of salary. In column P, you can indicate from where you got this fringe rate information. In our case, it was from the district's HR office. I'll skip over the national price columns Q through W because they follow the same pattern. That brings us to column X, where you need to enter the number of hours this person works annually, 2,080 hours in this case. Districts usually have schedules that tell you the number of hours each personnel position is supposed to work. In column Y, you enter how many hours this person actually spends on the program. In this case, it was 21 hours for the year. Column Z auto-populates by dividing column Y by column X. If you know the percentage of time someone dedicates to a program, you can enter that directly into column Z and not worry about X and Y. Column AA is the period over which the costs are spread. In this tab, this is auto-populated based on whether you indicated that the ingredient is a startup or ongoing requirement. Any ongoing costs are automatically assigned to a single year. So you'll see a default interest rate of zero in column AB as no amortization is needed for this ingredient. You can use column AC to change what percentage of this ingredient cost is included in your analysis. For example, if only half the students who do reading recovery at the district actually participated in your study, you would only want to account for 50% of the assistant superintendent's time in your analysis. Columns AD and AE in gray show the local and national cost of this ingredient before any discounting or compounding. In column AF, you indicate the year in which the ingredient was used, and then the dark green columns AG and AH take that into account to discount or compound local and national costs respectively to show the final cost estimates for this particular ingredient. In this case, because we're only looking at one year, these columns will be the same as AD and AE, about $2,300, for 1% of the assistant superintendent's time in year one. In column AI, you can enter any expenditure associated with the ingredient, and this will show up in a separate tally from the economic costs in the summary tables. As the assistant superintendent's salary is already in the annual budget, there was no new expenditure for her time. Columns AJ through AP are the last set of columns, and the yellow highlighted ones all have drop downs you can use. The first three, are more optional ways to break out your costs. If you use these columns, the breakdowns will be summarized for you in the summary tab. In column AM, you need to indicate whether the ingredient is a centralized cost that you will spread across multiple sites or a distributed cost, which is only incurred at the one site you indicated back in column B. In column AN, you can change yes to no to exclude an, ex an ingredient from your results. For example, if you're doing a treatment on the treated analysis and want to remove ingredients from schools that are treated. In AO, you choose the condition T or C. Finally, AP is for any notes that didn't fit anywhere else. And now you repeat that for every personnel ingredient that you need for each year. You can save time by copying and pasting rows. For example, if you want to enter the same person for several activities or years, You'll just need to change a few of the cells in the copied rows. Once you're done with personnel, you can move on to materials, facilities, and other inputs. The other three sheets are very similar, but there are a few differences to accommodate the peculiarities of estimating costs with different types of ingredients. For example, you won't be needing salaries or fringe rates in the other tabs. At this point, you would have a complete set of ingredients entered. 
If you only had one site in each condition, you're all done and ready to review results. However, if you have multiple sites and you want to see a breakdown of costs by site, there is a little more work to do. First, if you have any centralized costs that need to be spread across sites, like the assistant superintendent that we met in the personnel tab, who spent time on all the treatment schools, you'll need to visit the centralized cost tab to distribute those costs across the sites. This screenshot shows our completed centralized cost tab for the treatment sites. There is a separate one for the control sites. The instructions tell you what to do, but we'll also be producing some short video clips to demo specific features of CapCat that you can check out if you get stuck. Or you can submit a help request for one-on-one -on -one assistance. Slide 44. The last step, if you want to see costs broken out by each site, is to go to the cost by site tabs and pull in the site names for each condition. Here is my completed site list for the treatment schools. You can see the local cost results by site in columns C through J with the green headings and the national costs in columns K through R with the orange headings. Slide 45. All that's left now is to review the summary tables and decide which ones you want to present. There are 11 tables in each of the two summary tabs. If you cannot find what you need among the 22 tables CapCat provides, Find someone with good Excel, Excel skills and they can help you make your own. I'm just going to show you the first table, which is the summary metrics table. Column C is the local price column. The orange cells, C8 and 9, tell us that the treatment condition, which was reading recovery, cost 98,000 per school, and the control condition, fast forward reading, cost almost 12,000 per school. The blue cells, C10 and 11, show cost per student of seven and a half thousand for reading recovery and $900 for fast forward reading. Finally, the yellow cells, C12 and 13, show the incremental cost of reading recovery above and beyond fast forward reading. Most likely you'll want the incremental cost per student, 6,632, to combine with your effect size for reading recovery to get your cost effectiveness ratio. Column D shows the same metrics, but using the national prices we put in. Slide 46. The graphics tab has a couple of visual illustrations of the overall results. The bar charts at the top reflect the local price numbers I reviewed with you. The pie charts underneath show one of the cost breakdowns by category of ingredient. You can see that reading recovery costs are mostly for personnel, the blue part of the pie. This is typical for educational programs delivered by people. Fast forward reading is mostly for other inputs the yellow part of the pie, which is more typical for a technology-based intervention. And that is CapCat 1.2 for you. Feedback is welcome, which you can submit at our website. Thanks for hanging in with me. So now, if you are part of the live session, you can join us for a Q&A after this recording. Otherwise, thank you for your time. And if you have questions and would like to reach us, please visit catproject.org. And thanks to IES for their support. I see a question about whether our team conducts training similar to today's session. Well, we've done, um, we did a Q&A sessions for the IES um, RFAs during the summer. We do get invited to do webinars for people as part of our technical assistance. So we have a limited amount of sort of, of technical assistance time available, but um, we use it judiciously with the good advice of our program officer, Alan Ruby, who may, may be part of the meeting right now. So um, yes, we do provide more sort of like, um, we try and do somewhat interactive sessions and we like doing it in the context of the specific types of um, project that people are working on. So for example, I did one recently with the SLDS folks. I think Rob, you're about to work with the ED people. Um, the, what does the ED stand for again? Something about- educator. Yeah, Educator Effectiveness Grants, yeah. Yeah, we try yeah, and- Maybe in D development, maybe. <laughs> yeah, I mean, we're, we're big believers in helping people with their specific problem that um, we don't often do like, here's the lecture about what this is all about. So this, this actually was a bit painful for us because it's not 
<laughs> it's not directly tied to one person's topic. We get excited about helping people problem solve with their particular projects. Yeah. And but if you do want more general and in-depth training, there is IES also funds a, a methods training program that there's a there's a week-long training program. Um, that, uh, that I'm I'm part of that as well. And I think um, Brooks, uh, Brooks Bowden is the PI of that is presenting tomorrow at this conference. When is the next training, Rob? In July in Philadelphia. And actually the, uh, the applications for it, they're either open right now or they should be opening soon. Okay. All right, and I think we've gotten behind on, on a few questions. So I'm just trying to go back, I'll actually just um, read off three and we can try and tick through them. So one question is around recommendations for collaborating with folks who may be outside of the educational research space, in particular um, behavioral economists um, who maybe work in the public health space, you know, how to um, translate and share the work and help them understand the expectations for a cost analysis, particularly with IES. Uh, another question was around a question we often hear, um, thinking about local costs and national costs, what should we consider in addition to audience? Um, I actually will stop there because that's, those are two meaty questions and then I'll, I'll try and go back to the other questions that I'm seeing in the chat. Rob, why don't you take the one about- Yeah, I can take a, I can take a stab at the first one. Um, I'd actually be a little bit surprised if a, if a health economist did not have some background in, in cost analysis because cost, anal cost benefit analysis is actually somewhat more pervasive in health economics than educational economics. Um, uh, I would say as a bridge, uh, first of all, there's a couple of resources available, free, uh, free resources available. Uh, Henry Glicks at the University of Pennsylvania is um, I think a physician and economist, but does um, a lot of work in, in health economics. And there's some crossover there um, with educational economics. Um, I'd also say like even just having an economist on the team, even from a different field is actually a, a pretty good start and I think kind of a, a leg up. And, um, and then the translation might be to uh, the, uh, some of the terminology, some of the ways of thinking about resources in education that are a little bit different in healthcare. There are, um, uh, there, there are some important differences in terms of unit of analysis and um, things like that. Um, but I think that would be uh, a place where with a, with a solid foundation, um, that person could take advantage of things like the resources, the CAP resources and technical assistance to sort of help make those connections across fields. I don't know if John L. Fiona, if you would agree or would have anything to add to that. Yeah, I mean, just very practically, if you're talking about tools like CapCat, where um, you can customize it to whatever you want, you could put food items in there, you could put anything. Um, the the drop down list can be accommodated to hospitals, you know, patient rooms, wards, wh whatever it is. So we talk about education because that's what. We spend our time doing, but I don't think there are any of our tools that you couldn't use for any social program with a little bit of word vocabulary change. The, uh, I'm going to start on the national cost thing and then either of you can chime in. So you said, uh, what should you think about in, a term, in um, addition to audience for local and national costs? I'll tell you the, uh, the most practical thing to think about is where am I going to get these prices? Because if nobody wants to give you local costs and there's no public database, you're stuck. Uh, so find out if they're available before you promise to provide them. Um, with national costs, the, the problem that we find is that there are lots of national surveys with hundreds of salaries for teachers, different types of teachers, but you want to find like some special interventionist that you need for your specific program and there's no listing for that so you're going to have to sort of extrapolate from what's in a publicly available survey to come up with a price that's appropriate for your ingredient so i think there are limitations on both sides and um, availability of prices for your program are, are going to be a very important determination but um Anything else you want to add, Rob or Janelle, from your own experience? No, I, I think that's the most important second consideration is knowing if it's actually possible before you promise it. It's an important one. Um, I'm going to move on. There's a question specific 
Fiona to CapCap that I'm going to save. And I have the slides if you want me to share. I don't know if you have them. Um, but before we go to that question, I'm yeah, yes, to... yes is the answer. Okay. Um, so before we address that question, though, there are two people I saw that um, asked similar questions around um, the time that you need to allocate for the analysis, um, how to plan for it, and also um, asking about, you know, are there any clear differences between just using budget data versus doing uh, an economic evaluation? So I'll take this one. Um, another very common question, we are very much aware of the resources it takes to carry out a cost analysis and how constrained our budgets often are for evaluations. Um, so we have a few resources on our website that we try and tackle this. Um, one of the big things we always emphasize is integrating your cost analysis within your full evaluation planning it from the beginning at the proposal stage so that it is integrated and not something that's an add-on. Often you run into um, cost issues in terms of evaluation budget when your cost analysis hasn't been fully integrated into your study. Often you can collect data simultaneous, simultaneously, excuse me, or even use some of the data you're collecting for your evaluation as cost data, but if it's not integrated, you can't plan that part out. So that's usually the, the biggest um, point we try to make. In terms of using budget data as opposed to um, carrying out the full economic evaluation, um, so some things you definitely will be missing is budget data talk about kind of the plan, not what actually happened. It's how you planned to spend money. And so you will miss some of the costs that actually um, the in practice piece. And also the cost analysis is looking at all of the resources that are invested, which includes time. And that's a big one. That's usually the most expensive piece of implementing any intervention and budgets aren't gonna capture how much time people are investing. So we definitely hear you on um, the requirements that go into carrying out a cost analysis and we, we do it and our, we see the budgets. It's, it is a big chunk of your evaluation budget, but if you're going to do the cost cost analysis and actually gain the information you need to um, learn more about your program and your evaluation, it needs to be the full uh, cost analysis. That's my, you know, my Fiona and Rob, feel free to add or, or disagree. I think we should tackle some of the other questions. There's so many of them. I'm not sure how we're going to address them all, but um, maybe we can save the chat and follow up with people by email if we don't get to you all, because there are some really good questions here. So uh, I'm kind of looking to see where the, we did the training. Help. Well, Fiona, I know one that we talked quite a bit about is around the pandemic. Yeah. And if we've noticed um, new kinds of costs come up or even the way the pandemic's affected people's cost analyses. And I don't know if we want to take that one or if you saw another one that you thought you could get to. Uh, oops, sorry. Um, I was trying to unmute you, Norma, for some reason, instead of myself. <laughs> yes. um, so yeah, pandemic-related costs. I know we were doing a, a cost analysis, or I'm in the middle of doing one for an RCT, um, and uh, we had to add gloves, you know, like disposable gloves. Um, the big thing that really came up was um, what to do about internet costs, because everybody went home, and um, you know, who's who's paying for the internet? It's not free, right? <laughs> Just because everybody went home, they still are using resources at home. What to do about Zoom costs and things like that. So yes, definitely some um, new difficulties associated with trying to figure out where people are as well, because right now, I don't know if people were at home or at school. So where do you assign the costs? Fortunately, materials and facilities costs tend to be the very small um, percentage of costs. So I'm not super worried about it, but um, I like to try and get things in the right place. And it's very hard to do when you do not know where people are. Like I don't know where anybody is sitting who is behind uh, a black screen here, for example. Um, what next, Jonah? What else should we address? I'm gonna, uh, I will admit that I have skipped over a few questions, but. I'm trying to pick some of the big topic ones that are common questions. So the one I'm choosing now is around IES grants and um, how often you're encouraged to do a cost effectiveness analysis, um, especially for your efficacy studies and how 
in practice, you're only usually doing a single cost effectiveness ratio and whether or not that is good enough or, and, you know, advice that we have around that issue that everyone often runs into. So that's a common question that yeah. we get. And, and that's um, pretty linked, Janelle, to I think Shane's question, sort of above and below Drew's question about like, uh, um, essentially, like, can you, can you calculate a cost effectiveness ratio of a, of essentially a single intervention where the comparison is the control condition or the, or the comparison is like a pre condition, uh, like a pre post. Um, and I, I can start unless Fiona, you wanted to jump in. Um, I had three thoughts on this. Uh, one is, um, I think part of the idea, and I think part of IES's idea, I don't want to speak for IES, is, is to, even if some of these metrics are not all that useful or all that interpretable on their own, it, but by asking grantees to create and report them, it's to sort of start to create a sort of foundation in the, in the literature for, for some of these to exist for comparisons and for, for benchmarks. Um, I don't want to say too much more specific um, because because I'm not I'm not part of IES and or their their planning. Um, a second thing is I think it depends a little bit on what the metric you're using is. I think some metrics are inherently comparative and they are not even doing a sort of pre post or a treatment control comparison without having any kind of alternatives or multiple treatment arms or anything else you're comparing it to. Um, doesn't necessarily make much sense. Uh, I think it, uh, I, I'm not sure how exactly you'd interpret that for something like test scores, but it works a little bit better if you have something that's maybe a discrete unit. And so uh, we've, we've done things like a yield of additional graduates or, you know, uh, something like that, if you're looking at attainment outcomes. And uh, I think that makes a little more sense to be able to do that within the confines of a single program of just comparing a treatment or control arm or the control becomes your, your alternative or your baseline. Um, and the third way you could think about it is um, almost like a cost effectiveness ratio as a backdoor into a cost benefit analysis, which is not required by IES. Um, and this is sort of a very informal kind of back of the envelope way to do it. But if you come up with something like $10,000 per additional standard deviation in, in reading scores or something, that's, that's a lot. Uh, but, um, but let's say you come up with that, um, then you can kind of approach it more rhetorically. This is a little bit less rigorous and generalizable, but just sort of thinking through like a discussion section or implications, you can think through, well, well kind of, uh, it's, it's like one of those unsatisfying things in like a textbook of like, the exercise is left to the reader to determine whether $10,000 is a reasonable price for a standard deviation gain in, in test scores. Um, but, you know, you can sort of uh, think about that and, and um, let, let the decision makers make a value judgment as to whether that's worthwhile to them. So I think those are maybe maybe somewhat unsatisfying, but I think a few ways to think about um, sort of a single cost effectiveness ratio. And so uh, if you wanna, I don't know if you wanna add anything. Um, we have three minutes. So I was gonna actually do some follow-up in general, but if you wanted to add more, go ahead. No, do you think we've addressed all the questions? So their one lingering question is the about the template, uh, the CapCat that we demonstrated. So if we could come back to that, I'd like to. I wanted to just note Alan Ruby from IES put in the chat that both the slides and the recording should be available by tomorrow. And someone also suggested and asked if we could post the recording um, on the CAP project website. I know we would be happy to do that if we can work with IES to get a copy of it. Um, we can definitely share it on our website as well. Yeah, the template question is the one about B1314. Yes. So, so, yeah, I said yes. The answer is yes to that. I mean, you can, okay. you can make it what you want, uh, to be honest, because all it's doing is, uh, is taking the labels elsewhere. But I think that what you've suggested is the way I would think about it. Um, so normally I'd be putting my schools in as the um the main unit and then the students the the ones for which you're you're going to be really um estimating or effect size uh in the subunit or like if you're doing a professional development um intervention and the teachers are the ones that you're looking at for outcomes they would be the subunit 
Uh, I will say a couple of things on the tools. Um, this was CatCat 1.2 that we demoed. Um, we just released, I think this last weekend or the weekend before, CatCat 1.3, which is uh, an all singing, all dancing version of CatCat. CatCat 1.2, it goes up to 10 years, up to 10 programs. So if you do want to do a cost effectiveness analysis and not doing just treatment versus control, you can use that. Obviously, you don't have to use all 10. You can just use two or three. Um, so in addition to having more capability, the other thing it's really good for is if you have one of these huge sort of multi-site analyses in lots of geographical locations, it will do all the geographical adjustments for you, even at the ingredient level. So you can do apply one index to the whole thing. Um, you can shift local to national prices, national to local prices, or as I say, in individual ingredient levels. Um, in ingredient items can be adjusted. And um, we one. are just beginning to develop a series of online modules that will have a series of short videos um, demonstrating our tools and how to do a cost analysis using them, but they won't be ready until sort of next year, May, and we might be able to post some of it as we're going along. But I think we're kind of towards the one end. Note. Yes, just wanted to give one note on the um, cost templates, the cat cats. 1.0, 1.2, 1.3 do not denote old versions. They denote um, complexity. So 1.0 is a, a more simple cost template you could use. 1.2 is probably what most people need. And 1.3 is the most robust version where you can really you know, go into lots of lots more details like Fiona said, 10 years um, in terms of the cost analysis and other pieces. So be sure to look at all three and decide what works best for you. Okay, Alan, did you have anything you wanted to say before we finish? Oh, actually he can't say anything, can he? So. I guess he put in the chat that the things things will be available. All right. So and if you have follow up questions, you can visit our website, um, capproject.org, and feel free to either submit requests for help with your projects or other questions that you might have. And we really appreciate everyone's enthusiasm um, and uh, great questions today. Thanks for coming. Yeah. If you want to follow us on Twitter, we send out notifications when we have new products. It's at the Cat Project. Enjoy the rest of the conference. Bye, everyone.